afternoon now it is I see we have 12 o'clock here so I think we'll go ahead and get started we've got uh, folks still jumping on so we'll do some introductions here before we get started um, hey everyone I'm Caitlin Mellendorf I am a nutrition and wellness educator with University of Illinois Extension and I would like to welcome you to the autumn health picks series this series is a collaboration between Illinois Extension and the Interdisciplinary Health Sciences Institute at the University of Illinois. And this webinar series is designed to connect those across the state with researchers at the university and provide evidence-based educational programming. Now, a few things of housekeeping before we begin. I'm going to activate a poll. And this poll is to collect some basic information about our participants. Once you enter your information, feel free to minimize it off the screen. For those who are seeking CEUs or CPDUs, I'm going to add a message and a link to the chat box here in a minute for how uh, anyone who needs those continuing education credits can access that. So I will work on that here in just a minute. Here's the chat box. For anyone who needs CEUs or CPDUs, once you fill out that form in the link in the chat box, you'll be receiving a follow-up email with an evaluation that will need to be filled out to finalize your continuing education process. For anyone on the call today who is calling in who would like CEUs or CPDUs, uh, go to a web browser, so Chrome, uh, Mozilla, and what you'll type in is the URL address go.illinois.edu forward slash credits. I'm going to repeat that one more time, go.illinois.edu forward slash credits. If you have any questions during the program today, please type them in the chat box. If you are calling in, please hold your questions until the end of the session. Uh, based on preferences of our speaker today, we are going to wait until the end of our presentation today to answer questions. So as they come to you, please add them to the chat box. And without further ado, I'd like to introduce our speaker for this series, Layla Shin. Layla completed her bachelor's of, in food science and human nutrition with a concentration in dietetics at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign in May, 2015. From there, she went to Rush University Medical Center in Chicago, where she completed her dietetic internship and master's in clinical nutrition and specialized in pediatrics. She became a registered dietitian nutritionist in June 2017 and interned as a nutrition research intern with the National Dairy Council, where she focused on research translation, which inspired her to return to school to pursue a career in research. Layla is currently a third year PhD candidate at UIUC in the Division of Nutritional Sciences. And today she will be talking to us about get the facts on nutrition, know your labels. Layla, we're very excited to have you present. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to end our poll and let her begin. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, Caitlin. Um, so I hope that some of you were able to attend my webinar last semester on the gut microbiome, but for those of you who didn't, um, I do have this background slide here, and Caitlin gave a great introduction to my educational background. So I do bleed orange and blue. I am getting my PhD here at the University of Illinois. Um, my research focuses on how we can use the microbiome to give people personalized diet recommendations. And I am also a cat, dog, and plant mom, and an avid foodie. So, Getting into what we'll learn by the end of today's talk, you should be able to understand the differences between the old and new nutrition facts label. 
review other sources of nutrition information for the public, including MyPlate, the Dietary Guidelines for Americans, and supplement labels, and identify healthy food and supplement choices based on the knowledge gained related to the Nutrition Facts label, MyPlate, Dietary Guidelines, and supplement lab labeling. And so first we'll cover what the Dietary Guidelines for Americans are. We'll briefly go over some important definitions before we get more into the Nutrition Facts label. And then we'll briefly touch on front of package labeling, my plate, how to use all of this information to make healthy food choices, and then supplements before we end with a summary. And so to start, I wanna lay the groundwork of why we should care about all of these different guidelines and labels that are out there. So we know that nutrition and health are closely related. And according to the Dietary Guidelines for Americans or the DGAs, one in two American adults, so that's 117 million people, have one or more preventable chronic diseases, many of which are related to poor eating and physical activity patterns. And so this is what the Dietary Guidelines or the GDAs are created for. And so they help to provide evidence-based recommendations about how we can follow a healthy and nutritionally adequate diet. And they really focus on disease prevention rather than treating disease. And so these guidelines help to inform federal food, nutrition, and health policies, as well as programs that are developed. And so how are these developed? The DGAs are released every five years because we're constantly learning more about nutrition and health, and we want our guidelines for Americans to be based off of the most up-to-date research. But it's a process, and we actually have a new set of guidelines due to come out this year. And a fun fact is that a professor in the program I'm in, actually, the Division of Nutritional Sciences, Dr. Sharon Donovan, is on the committee to make the guidelines for this year. And so Dr. Donovan is one of many members of this external advisory committee that creates an advisory report, which is made from reviewing the science we have available at the time to support these recommendations. And so from this, the health Human Health Services and the United States Department of Agriculture released a really long document with all of this information detailed. And our current one is actually 144 pages long, which even as a dietitian, I am not going to read that. And so these agencies also released five guidelines with key recommendations for the five-year period based on the science from the advisory committee. And then these guidelines are implemented through different programs to educate the public. And so our current guidelines are still the 2015 to 2020 version. So the 2020 to 2025 guidelines is still underway. And you can actually view the progress of the development of these guidelines at this website here if you type that into your browser. So right now it's in the final stage of development. So hopefully we should be getting those out soon. But our current guidelines are first to follow a healthy eating pattern across our lifespan. And so that means that all food and beverage choices matter. We want to choose healthy eating patterns at appropriate calorie levels so that we can maintain a healthy weight, make sure we're getting enough nutrients, and reduce our risk of developing disease. We also want to focus on getting a variety of foods, different nutrients, and in different amounts so that we can meet our nutrient needs within our calorie limit. And we want to choose a variety of nutrient-dense foods across all of the different food groups that we have. We also want to limit calories from added sugars, as well as saturated fats and sodium. And so we want to consume a pattern that's low in these different nutrients. So we should cut back on those foods and beverages that are higher in these nutrients to amounts that can fit within a healthy eating pattern. And then the last two guidelines from our current guidelines are to shift to healthier food and beverage choices. So we want to choose those nutrient dense foods and beverages within the different food groups in place of less healthy choices. And in doing this, we want to consider cultural and personal preferences to make sure that these are shifts that we can maintain. And then we want to support healthy eating patterns for all. So we all have a role in helping to create and support eating patterns in multiple settings. Um, and so that could be a dietitian working in a hospital. It could be you at home taking care of yourself and your family. But what is a healthy eating pattern? 
And so a healthy eating pattern includes a variety of vegetables from all of the different groups. We have the dark green vegetables, red and orange, different beans and peas, starchy vegetables. We also have whole fruits. Um, fruit juice can count on that as well, but we really want to focus on trying to eat whole fruits when possible. Grains, at least half of which we want to make whole grains if that's allowable within our diet, as well as fat-free or low-fat dairy, including milk, yogurt, cheese, or fortified soy beverages, and a variety of protein foods, including seafood, lean meats, poultry, eggs, legumes, nuts, seeds, and soy products as well as healthy oils, um, like olive oil. And so, on the other hand, a healthy eating pattern limits saturated fats, trans fats, added sugars, and sodium, as we said. And that's a lot of information to remember. And again, we're not all going to read that 144-page document to get all of that information. And so, one of the best tools to help us follow this type of eating pattern is the nutrition facts label that we can see on those packaged foods we buy at the store. And so before we get into the nutrition facts label in detail, I want to define some key terms. So first, let's talk about what a calorie is. So a calorie is a unit measure, used to measure the energy content of foods and beverages. And as we know, our bodies need energy to function, grow, and thrive. Second, a nutrient is a substance in our food that our body uses to function and grow. So we get nutrients from what we eat and drink. So things like fat, carbohydrates, proteins, vitamins, minerals, and even water are nutrients because they're essential for life. And fats, carbohydrates, and proteins supply the calories to the foods and beverages that we eat and drink. And then the final definition I want to touch on is percent daily value or percent DV. And this tells us how much a nutrient in a serving of food contributes to our total diet. So it can help us determine if a serving of food is high or low in a nutrient and compare different food products. And so you'll find both calories and percent daily value useful terms to know when we're using the nutrition facts label. And so before I move on, I want to hear from all of you. Have any of you noticed that the nutrition facts label on products has changed earlier this year? And if so, what changes have you noticed? Um, and you can put your answers in the chat box. Yep, so everyone's pointing out that the added sugars have been added. That wasn't something that's been on there before. Yep, Erica said that there's bolded print of serving sizes, the calorie count is larger. There's different font sizes now, yes. So these changes have been made to hopefully help us to understand what's important to look at on the label. And so as we can see here, for example, those calories are huge on the label now and bolded. So we know that that's the energy that we're getting um, from the food. And so once we become familiar with it and how to use it, the label can be an extremely helpful tool for you and your family to help you make healthier food choices. So first, I want to consider some important questions. Like, what is the nutrition facts label? Where we can find it? Why it's important? And I also want you to think during this talk, if you use the nutrition facts label, and if you do or don't, I want you to reflect on why you use it or why you don't use it at this time. And hopefully, if you don't, I can convince you to look at it the next time you're at the grocery store. So starting with what the Nutrition Facts Label is, the Nutrition Facts Label is regulated by the United States Food and Drug Administration, and it's required on most food and beverage packages. So it provides us with important information about the nutritional content of food and beverages. We can find the label on food and beverage packaging and containers, such as boxes, bags, bottles, cans, most of those things that you'll see on the shelves in stores. Why it's important is that it can help us to make informed choices about the foods and beverages we decide to eat and drink. And these decisions can help us to promote good nutrition and good health for us and our family. And so I would like to know if you currently use the Nutrition Facts label, um, why or why not. And if you do, 
what specific sections do you look at when you're looking at that label? Um, and again, you can feel free to put those answers in the chat box. Great, so I see a lot of people are already using the label and looking at all these different important nutrients, sodium for hypertension, a lot of people are saying sugars, fat, calories, yes. So that's great. I'm glad that we're all using the label and hopefully it's helpful to all of you when we're making choices. Um, so I will go over some of the important concepts behind each of these different nutrients and hopefully this will help you to use that label better and maybe Let's say you're only looking at sodium right now, I can convince you to look at another nutrient the next time you're in the store. And so here's the original Nutrition Facts label. So I feel like this looks familiar to most of you that are interacting with me in the chat. So as I mentioned, the Nutrition Facts label provides us that nutrition information about foods and beverages. So it shows us that serving size up here, um, the number of servings per container, calories, and then percent daily value for a bunch of different nutrients. And so the new and improved label you can see here looks a little bit different. And I think that it's a little easier for us to read. So we really see that call out to the calories and we'll take a closer look at the nutrition facts label here. So I wanna point out here that this example is provided by the Food and Drug Administration or the FDA. And unfortunately, on their website, they don't list what this food exactly is. But based on the ingredients, I just kind of want to help us get that visual as we're looking at this to make it more relatable. And so it seems like this might be a cereal or granola product. And so when we're looking at this, um, this label, let's think about it in terms of like a granola bar, for example, is what we're reading here. And so again, we can see that side-by-side -side comparison here. We see that it's easier to call things out. We see those added sugars added as well. And so the, the FDA has updated this. And so you've likely seen that this new label on foods and beverages in local stores, but we'll walk through the differences between the original label and the new label as a group. And so again, we can see that serving sizes has been updated. And so it's to be more realistic to what people actually eat and drink. So the point of a serving size is that we want it to be a serving size that's realistic. So if a serving size of ice cream was like a quarter cup, I don't think any of us only eat a quarter cup of ice cream. And so that's been updated to really reflect what the average American would eat for a typical sit down serving. Again, as many of you pointed out, the calories is now in a larger and bolder font. And you'll also notice that calories from fat has been removed. And this is because research shows that the type of fat we consume is more important than the amount of fat we consume. We also see those added sugars added as a gram amount, as well as percent daily value. And this is now required on the label. So grams aren't required for single ingredient sugars, like table sugar, for example, or honey, but they are listed here in total. And then you'll also notice down here at the bottom that these vitamins and minerals are updated. So we can see that vitamin A and vitamin C are no longer required on the label. And that's because deficiencies of these vitamins are not very common today. But vitamin D and potassium are now required on the label because Americans don't always get the recommended amounts of those nutrients. And so the actual amount in milligrams or micrograms can be seen on the label for these nutrients as well as percent daily value. And then the daily values for nutrients have been updated based on new scientific evidence. And so the footnote at the bottom of the label has also changed so that we can better explain what percent daily value tells us. And so let's break this label down into each of those sections that I just gave an overview of. So starting at the top, this first line tells us the servings per container, which is the total number of servings in the entire food package or container. And it's common for one package of food to contain more than one serving. And so that second line here is serving size. 
And the serving size is based on the amount of food that people typically eat at one time. So this is not a recommendation of how much you should eat, but it's just based on what the average American would eat in one city. And so the information listed on the label here is based on the serving size listed. And so sometimes you'll see that second column that'll tell us the information based on the entire package. And it's often shown as a common household measure that's appropriate to the food. So for example, if it was a piece of bread, it would say one slice rather than the amount in grams or ounces individually because we're not gonna know what that means. But then they will follow it with that metric amount here. And so when we are comparing calories and nutrients in different foods, we wanna make sure that we're checking the serving size to make sure that we're making an accurate comparison. Because for example, one food serving size might be one cup, but that the other product could be half cup. And so you'd wanna multiply that one by double to make sure that you're truly comparing the nutrients and the same amount of food. That next line we see is the calories per serving. And a general guideline is that we need 2,000 calories per day. But it's important to remember that calorie needs per each individual person are different based on um, our weight, our age, gender, height, and how physically active we are. And so later I will provide a resource to kind of refer to for your personal calorie needs. Next, we have the percent daily value column, which is shown on the right side here. And so percent DV is established by the FDA for different nutrients based on how much of that nutrient our body needs. So we can use the percent DV to determine how much of a nutrient is in a food. And so as a general guide, 5% DV or less of a nutrient is considered low and 20% or more of a nutrient is considered high. And it's important to note here that some nutrients such as protein, for example, and trans fat do not have a percent DV listed on the label. And so protein doesn't have that listed there because the amount we need will vary based on our age and physical activity. So there's not one set recommendation across the population. And then for trans fat, um, it's, we're supposed to avoid trans fat as much as possible. Because, so there's not a percent DV because we don't want to aim to get a certain amount of trans fat in our daily diet. Then the label also lists these nutrients contained in the food product. And so we can use this section to help us choose products that are lower in nutrients we want to get less of and higher in nutrients we want to get more of. And so nutrients we want to get less of include saturated fat, trans fat, sodium, and added sugar. So most Americans eat more than the recommended amount for these nutrients. And diets higher in these nutrients have been associated with increased risk of disease, such as heart disease or high blood pressure. And so you wanna compare and choose foods to get less than 100% DV of these nutrients each day. And again, let's remember here that trans fat doesn't have that percent DV, so you would look at the number of grams here to make sure that you're limiting that nutrient. And the nutrients that we want to get more of are dietary fiber, vitamin D, calcium, iron, and potassium. And on the other hand, many of us don't get the recommended amount of these nutrients. So again, if possible, we want to try and choose foods to help us reach that 100% DV on most days. And so let's test our knowledge here. I know I just covered a lot. Um, so please give me your answers in the chat box so I can make sure that at least someone is understanding what I've shared here. Um, so starting with this label on the right, what is the serving size of this food? Yep, Janet, got it, yep. So two-thirds cup right here in that big bold is the serving size here. And how many calories are in one serving of this food? 230, it's that big thing. I think this is the one we can't miss on the label. And then can someone tell me how many servings are in the entire container of this food? We got eight here. And so my final question for you is how many calories are the entire container? So if I was to eat this entire container of food, how many calories would I be eating? Yep, 1840 is the answer there. So we get that, 
you just multiply the number of servings per container by the number of calories. So that's 1840 calories if we eat that entire container here. So I do want us to keep in mind that if you do eat or drink two or more servings of a food or beverage, you are getting that double or more of calories or nutrients listed on the label. And so I want to come up, move into kind of those individual nutrients. And so our nutrition facts label shows us the total amount of fat contained in the product and its percent daily value, as well as two types of fat. So we have saturated fat listed and trans fat. And I think dietary fat is often demonized. We always hear that fat's bad for us, but it is really important for us and it's actually a necessary nutrient in our diet. It helps us to provide energy, helps us absorb vitamins and support several key processes in our bodies like growth and development. And if those of you that are here were able to attend Corinne's talk earlier this semester, you can remember back that when she was talking about carotenoids, that fat is really important for us to be able to absorb those important nutrients like carotenoids. But we do want to think about the different types of fat when we're looking at this. And so thinking about saturated and trans fat, this is required on the nutrition facts label as we see it listed here. And in general, diets that are higher in saturated or trans fat are associated with increased levels of total cholesterol and our low density lipoprotein or LDL cholesterol that's known as our bad cholesterol. And so these types of fats are found in foods like animal fats, such as butter, vegetable shortening, different meats and poultry, um, higher fat dairy products, mixed dishes if we think of like burgers, sandwiches, pizza, those processed meats, poultry products like bacon and hot dogs, as well as some of my personal favorites, the baked goods, snack foods, and sweets. And so again, I want to point out here that we shouldn't we don't want to fear these foods. And as you can see by this picture here, like I'm salivating looking at this, these are good foods and they're yummy to enjoy, but we really just want to think about limiting these foods and making sure that we're adding more of those foods that have those nutrients that we really want to focus on. And so one way to do that is that we want to try to replace saturated fat with unsaturated fat, especially what are called monounsaturated and polyunsaturated fats which I'll share some examples of on the next slide. But these fats are associated with lower levels of total cholesterol and that bad LDL cholesterol. And so these fats are voluntarily listed on the nutrition facts label. And these can be found in foods like avocados, fish, nuts, seeds, olives, and some vegetable oils as well. And then so moving from fat um, to another nutrient that we want to look out for is added sugars. So what is an added sugar? Added sugars include sugars that are added during packaging or processing of foods. For example, a bag of table sugar, sugars that are in syrups and honey, and sugars from concentrated fruit or vegetable juices. And it also includes sugars that you might add into your diet. So if you're pouring syrup on top of your pancakes, or sugar into your tea or coffee, that counts as an added sugar as well. And sugars from concentrated fruit or vegetable juices, those are often added in jams and jellies. And so we can see here that most of our added sugars come from beverages here. And those would be things like those sugar sweetened beverages like pop or soda. And I wanna show you all where you can find added sugars. So we know that that's on the nutrition facts label here but it's also important to check that ingredients list. And so we can see here that the first ingredient listed here is a whole grain blend of different grains. And so a lot of people don't realize that the ingredients list is listed by descending order of weight. And so that means that this whole grain blend makes up the highest amount of ingredients in this product. And so something that you might think is really healthy because you see, oh, there's that whole grain blend, there's oats in here, there's a ton of barley, different whole grains that are healthy for me. You can see that second ingredient by weight is corn syrup. And that's what's contributing that 10 grams of added sugars to this product. And so it really is a great way to check for sugars, not only by looking here, 
but also looking down at the ingredients. And so you can see here I've listed, and these slides will be shared too, um, but here's some common names for added sugars that you might not necessarily think of. So sugar and brown sugar, corn syrup, we know those are sugars, but there's also different things, even honey, maple syrup, different types of syrup, and these glucose, dextrose, maltose, and sucrose are different kinds of sugars. And so those are other terms you can look for when you're looking at that ingredients list. And these are often found, again, in those yummy things we think about, those baked goods, desserts, and surprisingly things like salad dressings, condiments like ketchup have a lot of sugar in them. Um, and I am an avid ketchup lover, so I'm not telling you not to use ketchup because I put it on everything. But I do want us to just all be aware that it can be in things that we're not really thinking of. And looking at that ingredients list can help us to see what those ingredients really are. And so, Thinking about how much added sugar is too much for us. So if we're on a 2,000 calorie diet, we don't want to get more than 50 grams per day, which is equivalent to about 12 teaspoons. And so if you want to convert grams to teaspoons, you would just divide that number by four. And so again, when you're trying to think about, you know, is this too much added sugar, look at that nutrition facts label and that percent DV side. And remember that 5% or less is low in added sugars and 20% or more would be considered high in adding sugar. And so again, I'm gonna quiz you all here. Um, so looking at this label on the right, which of the nutrients listed here would be considered to have a high percent daily value? Yep, so iron is there. Iron's at 45%, calcium's at 20%, and those added sugars are at 20%. So those are all high because they're 20% or greater daily value. And then on the other hand, which nutrients have a low percent daily value? That cholesterol has a zero there, potassium is at six, so it's not technically low, but it's getting there close to five. And then we have our saturated fat, five or lower. And so anything again below five is low, above 20 or above is high. And then can anyone remember which of these nutrients we want to get more of? Yes. Yeah. So we want to get more of that dietary fiber, as well as those vitamins and minerals listed at the bottom of the label. And I think I drilled this into your head, so this should be an easier question. Which ones do we want to get less of here? Got those added sugars, saturated fat, trans fat, and sodium. Yep, you guys all hit it on the head. Okay, so I'm going to move into uh, my plate. But before we do that, I wanted to touch on this briefly. And so for the sake of time, I'm not going to talk about front of label um, packaging too much. But I also want to point out that there are, you know, often see those labels on the front as well as the nutrition facts label. So things might be labeled as organic, being made with whole fruit, having a certain amount of certain vitamins, be non-GMO, sugar-free, fat-free, this could be an entire webinar in itself. Um, and so I just didn't try to delve into it because I knew I would get carried away. But these are another great source of something that you can look at on the front of a product to see if it's a good source of certain nutrients, for example, because these are labels are also all regulated by the FDA as well. So they have to be approved before they can be added to the label. So different manufacturers can't just put heart healthy on the label unless there's research there to support that it has, um, you know, like certain amounts of fat, fiber, or have been supported by research to support that type of claim. And so these can also help you if you're trying to look for things that are low in fat, for example, or high in certain vitamins and minerals. And so I want to touch on one other tool that can help us in choosing healthy foods. And so one of these tools that the FDA uses to translate this information 
so that we don't have to read all 144 pages of the DGAs. And when we think of things like fresh foods, for example, that don't have a nutrition fact label, is my plate. And so I'm sure many of you have probably seen an image like this before. And so for those of us that are familiar with the food pyramid that came before this, my plate replaced the food pyramid in 2011 because the food pyramid didn't really show that we should balance the five food groups within our meals. It really favored grains and limited oils and fats. And I like to think that we eat off of a plate rather than a pyramid. So this is a much nicer visual for us to apply for our daily lives. And so these recommendations from my plate are informed by the dietary guidelines and they are to focus on making healthy food and beverage choices from all five food groups. We want to focus on variety, amount, and nutrition. Trying to make half of our plate fruits and vegetables and making leaner and more varied selections of protein foods. So things like poultry, beans, fish, and making at least half of the grains we consume whole grains and choosing lower fat dairy products that are either skim or 1%. And so there's a lot of information here. So I wanna to touch on how we can use all this information to make healthy food choices. So as we know, good nutrition can lead to better health for us and knowing how to make these healthier food choices when shopping, cooking and eating is key to improving our nutrition. And of course the nutrition facts label can help when we're keeping the DGAs and my plate in mind. So let's talk about some practical ways to bring good nutrition into your daily life. And here I'll touch on a few points, but if you were able to attend Jonathan's talk recently, he talks about a lot of different great resources and apps that you can use. So if you weren't able to attend, um, that is posted on the website. So you can watch that and review his slides as well. And there's a lot of great resources there that can help you to make these healthy choices. And so this starts with smart shopping. So how have food shopping choices influenced how you eat? So do you usually eat healthier meals when you plan ahead and purchase items you need for your recipes at the store? So for example, I know that if I pick out recipes for the week and I go to the grocery store once a week, rather than last minute deciding every day, I tend to make meals that are centered around those my plate recommendations. So if I go to the store without a plan, I'm more likely to grab whatever is convenient for me and not as nutrient dense. And I'm sure you all notice that if you go to the store hungry, you're more likely to buy those impulse purchases. And so it's a good plan to make a list and stick to it, like Jonathan mentioned in his talk. And so to do smart shop food shopping and cooking, we always want to make sure that we check that nutrition facts label and ingredient list when we're buying packaged foods. Eat before you shop, because again, if you're hungry, you're just going to impulse buy. Um, and get those unhealthy food choices. Using fresh fruits and vegetables that are in season can make them easier to get. They have more flavor and are usually less expensive. And we also want to be aware that canned and frozen fruits and vegetables are just as healthy of a choice. They can be less expensive than fresh, um, but we want to make sure that we're choosing fruit that's in 100% juice without added sugars and vegetables that say low sodium or no salt added on the label. And it's also nice when we have this nice weather that's not exactly fall weather yet to think outside the store. So things like farmers markets and farm stands can be great options for picking up fresh produce at a lower price. We also want to remember to use that label to compare foods. So when comparing products for calories and nutrients, we want to make sure we check that serving size to make sure that we're aware of any differences. The serving size is based on, again, that amount of food that is typically eaten at one time and isn't necessarily a recommendation. We always want to remember to maintain a healthy body weight by balancing the number of calories we eat and drink. And so this link here, which is also included at the end of my talk, I believe, um, can help you to see what your personal calorie needs are and then compare and choose products that fit your needs. And remember that percent DV, so that 5% per serving being low and 20% or more being high. So when you're in the store, in the bread aisle, if you're shopping for that bread, look for breads that are higher in dietary fiber and make half of your grains whole. 
when looking for whole grains, you want to check that ingredients list and choose products that name a whole grain ingredient first. So look for things like whole wheat, brown rice, bulgur, oatmeal, whole rye, whole oats. It should say that whole grain thing there, um, and that should help. You want to try low or non-fat dairy products like skim milk, non-fat yogurt, and you reduced fat cheese that contain less saturated fat and sodium than most full fat products. And compare snacks to make sure that you're choosing versions that are lower in that saturated fat, sodium, and added sugars. And fruits and vegetables are always great snack options. And so in choosing those more fruits and vegetables, fresh, frozen, or canned can be great choices. And remember to look for those low sodium or no sweeteners added versions. And instead of buying those sweetened sugar beverages, we really want to focus on drinking water. Um, so, you know, bottling your own water and carrying it with you is easy on your wallet and it has zero calories. And so keeping this advice in mind and as space permits, if you do see an item on sale, it's a great idea to stock up and freeze or store extras until you need them. And so again, we really want to make sure we look at that ingredients list which can show us the ingredients in a food. Um, this is my question slide again, I'm sorry for that. Um, but remembering that we want to get more of those healthy ingredients, those whole grain ingredients, and limiting those things like added sugar. And then at home, once we get back in the store, we know that cooking at home can help us to eat healthier. And so if you're able to prepare ingredients ahead of time, that saves a lot of the burden that you feel if you feel like you have to cook every day. And it can help you to change things up by trying healthy and new ways to prepare food. So ask friends and family members for their favorite healthy recipes. There's a lot of great healthy recipes online. I think Jonathan shared some of those as well. And if we choose simple healthy recipes that call for ingredients like fresh vegetables and lean proteins that can help us to have a flavorful meal that's still healthy. And my plate website has a lot of great recipes and cookbooks. And there are ways to add flavor without adding sodium. So herbs, spices, as well as no salt seasoning. And again, saving that time and that burden of cooking, chilling and saving leftovers for the week to eat later can be a really great way to meal prep and save that time and still have healthy foods to eat. And so when we think about eating out, um, in today's busy world, we know that Americans eat and drink about one third of their calories from foods prepared away from home. So eating out can be convenient and fun, but it can be challenging when you want to make healthy choices. And so these foods, when you're eating out, are more likely to be higher in those calories and sodium. And so we want to think about our calorie needs when we're eating out. And we also want to think about that a lot of um, calorie information can be made available on menus before you order. And so I will point out here, I will touch on the calories a little bit. These slides have been ad adapted from the FDA and they are very like calorie heavy. And I want you all to be aware of this information so that you know it's available. Um, but eating out is supposed to be an enjoyable experience and I really don't want you to feel guilt because you see something's really high in calories and you're like, oh, well, that's so high in calories, I can't enjoy that. I oftentimes, if I see something that sounds delicious, and I'm like, well, that's a lot more than I feel like I should eat right now, I'll look like a crazy person and ask for a box before the food comes out, and I'll bring half of it home for another meal later. And so I really don't want these menu calories and nutrition facts that are available to become a source of guilt and anxiety for people. I just want you to be aware that that information is there if you're looking for it. And so calories are available on menus, menu boards, self-service foods, and foods on display at different food establishments that are part of a chain with 20 or more locations. So chain restaurants, for example, like McDonald's, chain coffee shops like Starbucks, different bakeries, ice cream shops, self-service foods, movie theaters, amusement parks, and a lot of the time, They'll have calories up there, but if you ask, it might also have saturated fat, sodium, and dietary fiber available. Uh, and I'm like the one weird person at the restaurant that will ask for this information. So don't hesitate to ask. They have it available if you would like it. Um, and so if they don't have it, I mean, at least you asked. Um, 
And so again, knowing your options when eating out. So thinking about those calorie needs, looking for that nutrition information and making that best choice for you. So how do we do that? We want to compare the calorie and nutrition information to help us to make the decision that's best for us before we order. And keep in mind that side dishes can add a lot of calories to a meal. And so that calorie information can help us decide how much we want to enjoy now, how much to save later. And asking for things like sauces and salad dressings on the side can help you choose kind of how much to use on your own food. And just keep in mind that foods that are described with words like creamy, fried, breaded, battered, or buttered are going to be those ones that are higher in calories and fat. And the foods that say baked, roasted, steamed, grilled, broiled, those are going to be the quote unquote healthier options. And also keep in mind that calories from beverages that aren't water add up quickly. And so I want us to all note here that small changes add up. So we always want to try and choose from the five food groups. So trying to balance those vegetables, fruits, grains, especially whole grains, protein foods, and dairy. And when we're at home, try a new way of cooking. So instead of frying, we try baking, broiling, steaming, and grilling. I recently bought an air fryer. Well, I've had it actually in my pantry for over a year. My husband and I just recently started using it, and I am like so disappointed that I haven't used it earlier. So that can help you to save on a lot of oil for what you would usually fry, and it still tastes delicious. You can also get creative with herbs and spices to add flavor. And when eating out, again, you want to think about that nutrition information when you're making those choices. So before we end and I take some questions, I do want to touch on dietary supplements. And I have a question for you, but I want to say here that again, dietary supplements can be a whole talk in themselves. And so I really just want to give you some brief information here because they are a part, they can be a healthy part of our diet. And so if you're willing to share, if you're comfortable, do you take any supplements? And if so, which one? So I will say as a graduate student, I am often cooped up inside staring at my computer so I don't get a lot of sunlight, and I personally take a vitamin D supplement because I know that I am not getting enough. And so even as a dietitian, it can be overwhelming when you're at a store and you're trying to decide which of those 10 options for vitamin D, let's say, for example, is the best one to buy. So, yeah, I see a lot of the attendees here also take vitamin D. I see fish oil, multivitamins, magnesium, a lot of those different minerals. Um, so these also can be a great supplement to your diet. But what is a dietary supplement? And so the FDA defines a dietary supplement as something that you take by mouth. So that could be a tablet, capsule, powder, or liquid. And it's made to supplement our diet. So to kind of help us fill in those gaps of nutrients that we are have trouble getting. So I said that we now have added vitamin D and potassium to the food label. I can see that a lot of us are taking vitamin D and that can be a hard nutrient to get. And so a supplement is a great way to make sure we're getting that in our diet. They also have one or more ingredients, including vitamins, minerals, herbs, or other botanicals, different amino acids, enzymes, different extracts from different tissues that will help our health. But I also want to point out that there are some things for us to consider. And so the FDA, while they review that front of like packaging labeling and the nutrition facts label, they do not review dietary supplement products for safety and effectiveness before they are marketed. And so there are interactions possible. So they could interact with their medications or pose risks if you have a certain medical problem or are going to have surgery. And many of these supplements haven't been tested in pregnant women, nursing mothers, or children. And so what's listed on the label of a dietary supplement may not necessarily be what's in the product. And so there is the potential for contamination. And there have actually, unfortunately, been some supplements that have been found to contain hidden prescription drugs or other compounds. So particularly supplements that have been marketed for weight loss, sexual health and athletic performance or bodybuilding. And so I want to point out that natural does not always mean safe. So for example, an herb called kava is natural, but it can cause serious harm to our livers. 
So when you see terms like standardized, verified, or certified on a bottle, that doesn't necessarily guarantee product quality or consistency. And so for me to feel safe, I personally only buy supplements that have this USP verified mark because this mark means that the product contains the ingredients listed on the label and the declared amount that's on there. It does not contain harmful levels of specified contaminant, and it will break down and release into our body within a specified amount of time. And I also feel safe with this um, because it shows that it has been made according to the FDA's good manufacturing practices. So they assure that it's safe, sanitary, um, and well-controlled in manufacturing, and it shows that the supplement manufacturer is conscious of the quality and that it will be consistent from batch to batch. So this USP is a scientific organization that sets standards for these different medicine purities. And so looking for this on a supplement can help you make sure that what's really, what that bottle really says is in the supplement is in there. And so to summarize what we covered today, we know that the Nutrition Facts label is our daily tool for good nutrition. And the new label features that serving size in a bolder font, those so updated serving sizes, amounts, calories in a larger font, daily values have been updated, added sugars have been added, and then vitamin D and potassium have been added as well, as well as that footnote to better explain what daily value tells us. And when we're making healthy choices at the store, we want to think about shopping smart, using that nutrition facts label on food and beverages. And this is a nice little guide um, that I believe FDA can provide. Uh, quick tips for reading the nutrition facts label. So this is a little tip card you can print off for your wallet or purse um, to help you kind of remember some of the things we talked about. And then, I'm sorry, I didn't animate this one properly, but at home, we want to choose food from all five food groups, plan our weekly meals when possible, and try new healthy recipes and ways to prepare food. And then when we're eating out, again, thinking about our calorie and nutrition needs, and making choices that are best for us. And then going back to those dietary supplements, make informed decisions. So the standards for marketing supplements are very different from the standards for drugs. So for example, marketers of a supplement don't have to prove to the FDA that it's safe or that it works before it's on the grocery store shelf. So you wanna really take the time to review the scientific evidence about the safety of a dietary supplement and whether it works. And I have a whole slide at the end that has resources just on dietary supplements that can help you make those decisions. I also want to point out that you should talk to your healthcare providers about any complementary health products or practices you're using, including dietary supplements, because this can help give them a full picture of what you're doing to manage your health, and they can help to coordinate that safe care for you. And so to end, I'll just show you these resources here. So I have a slide with the toolkit that um, I pulled a lot of these slides from, different information from the FDA. There's that chart I was telling you about for the needs of your calories. The dietary guidelines for Americans are linked here as well as my plate resources. And then there's a whole slide on resources for different supplement information. Before I end and take questions, I want to remind you that next week we have Shelby Keith, who is a student in kinesiology here, talking about active aging and how we can use exercise to maintain our health across the lifespan. Um, so please plan to tune into that because she will give you some great information about physical activity guidelines and how they can be beneficial for us. And then before we end, um, you can take our survey here and then I'll leave this up for a little bit, but I do have a key messages slide that we can refer to for questions to kind of help gauge those if you haven't asked yours yet. And with that, I really want to thank you all for attending and for your time here. Thank you, Layla. That was great. So as we wrap up today, uh, before we get to questions, uh, you can use the QR code on the screen to fill out the survey. I am going to add that survey to the chat box as well. So if you prefer to do that route, you are welcome to do that. 
Um, as Layla already mentioned as well, so next week, October the 21st, we will have the active aging using exercise to maintain health across the lifespan uh, session. So please come back for that one. I am also going to reactivate the poll that we had a little earlier. So if you had not already uh, done the poll, if you maybe popped on a few minutes later, please feel free to um, vote again and or I guess the first time so I'll put that up there uh, for everyone to vote and uh, when you're done with that I will leave the poll open but you can minimize the screen so you can get there and then we've just got a few minutes here so fortunately we just had a few questions so first question Layla um, for the dietary guidelines um, these are prevention and information for the general population. The question is, where do we look for uh, eating and nutrition guidelines for type 2 diabetes, type 1 diabetes, and other chronic health conditions? Great. That is a great question. That is a really good point because there are, these dietary guidelines for Americans are very detailed, but there is so much research out there that they are focused on a healthy population. And so if you do have a certain chronic disease state or a different health state, there are, for the most part, these can also be helpful. But I think it is important to talk about that one with your health provider because they can talk about the importance of um, how these guidelines could be tailored to you. But a lot of these things like diabetes, for example, have organizations. So the American Diabetic Association would be a great website to look at. They have a lot of information specifically for diabetes. There's a lot of recipes on there um, and tips to follow there. And so I think there is a way to combine the dietary guidelines for Americans for healthy populations, even if you have a chronic disease state, but there's a lot of great organizations that we have nationwide as well, like the American Diabetes Association that can provide those resources specifically for you. Great, the next question, you had showed uh, on an earlier part of your presentation about some of the healthier and less healthy types of fats. One that you didn't mention was coconut oil, and this question uh, asked uh, if you could explain a little bit more about where coconut oil fits on the healthier and less healthy fats. Yes, so coconut oil is one of those products that has gained a lot of hype recently. And so it is still a saturated fat source. So one way to easily remember what fats are saturated and unsaturated is if it's at room temperature and it's solid, that's a saturated fat. So if we think about butter, for example, that's solid at room temperature. Coconut oil is another one of those ones that's solid at room temperature. Um, olive oil is unsaturated because it's that liquid at room temperature. So coconut oil has had a lot of hype surrounding things like helping with memory and things like that, for example, but it is still a saturated fat. And so if you consume coconut oil, I would still say to limit that. I think it's tasty as well. I personally enjoy coconut oil sometimes. Um, and while it may have some benefits that have been shown in research, your body is still going to treat it like one of those saturated fats when you consume it. So I wouldn't say that you shouldn't consume coconut oil, but really think about limiting it because it is in that saturated fat group. Well, while that question popped up, I was thinking, and I found the article. So um, the American Heart Association uh, Journal put out a recent uh, review earlier this year. Uh, yeah. to finally, actually add that uh, intake, high intake of coconut oil did increase LDL cholesterol, which is what we dubbed mm -hmm. you know, quote unquote bad cholesterol. So we now yeah. have some information to support uh, the fact that yes, it is a saturated fat and it does in fact uh, increase cholesterol numbers. Correct, yeah, that's great. And then one last question. Um, so if a product contains a half a gram of trans fat per serving and the front of the label says it states that there's no trans fat, so if you eat two servings of the trans fat, you would then be eating one gram of trans fat. Is that correct? Yes, that is correct. So through the regulations, so they're not perfect by any means, they're flawless. If something contains less than one gram of trans fat, then the label can say that it has zero grams of trans fat when in reality it has some in it. 
So that question is accurate. If you were to eat something that had 0.5 grams, even though it said zero on the label, you would then be consuming one gram if you ate two of that serving. Um, so that is accurate. And again, think about those trans fat and things like fried food. So I know that I'm a guilty, my guilty pleasure is donuts. And so like pandemonium out here, for example, they don't have their nutrition facts label listed for donuts. But when you're eating a donut, for example, there is um, trans fat in that. And so again, I don't think that you should be freaking out like, oh my gosh, I just ate a gram of trans fat if you eat two servings of a baked good that has that in there. But just be aware that there still could be small amounts of trans fat in something you're eating and limit those types of foods that would be fried like that or have high amounts of oil that could add to that um, trans fat consumption. Thank you. So we have just passed our one o'clock hour. Um, so thank you to everyone who attended today. And we hope to see you on next week for another uh, presentation. Um, we will, I, I say, I'll, I'll hang around here a little bit, um, but uh, otherwise, have a great rest of your afternoon, and we will talk to everyone soon.